Bonjour, hi, I'm Denis Garnier, CEO and CTO of Trizotech, and I'm joined today with, uh, by John Sviverly, our Chief Medical Informatic Officer. Uh, our presentation today will be on integrating clinical workflow and decision with Fire, CDS Hook, and Smart on Fire. It's basically an introduction to the Trizotech Healthcare Features set. So we have a lot of different things we want to show you. Hopefully we're going to provide you with as much guidance and do some demos that will uh, enlighten you about what we're talking about here. So let's just get going. So our goal today is really to present uh, the marrying of two sets of families of standards. <clears throat> Excuse me. In particular, uh, the OMG standard, the Object Management Group standards, which includes the BPMN, DMN, and CMMN standards. We'll talk a little bit about what these are. And we're also introducing in there, in the mix, the HL7 based type standards like Fire, CDS Hook, and Smart. So we're basically looking at how we can bring all this together to give us a higher level solution. So a little, a little bit of basic terminology here. We're talking about workflow automation and decision automation, where the workflow automation is really a set of technology that enable the orchestration of activities to react to different business events. In our case, probably clinical or healthcare type of events. And the decision automation is a technology to enable the decision, basically providing you an answer uh, to a question given some inputs. So both of these kind of technology can have human in the loops or just be straight through processing by the automation. Um, from the object management group, we're interested in three particular standards. Um, the DMN standard, the decision model and notation, is a visual graphical notation to help you capture in a visual way your decisions using decision table and some logical expression in what's called boxed expression. Then we have BPMN, the business process model and notation. Uh, BPMN is a visual notation to capture your processes or the workflow, how activities go. So basically when this is done, then do this, then do that, et cetera. And it's a pres prescriptive sequence of activity that is provided with BPMN. And then there's CMMN, which is the case management model annotation. Again, another visual uh, notation to capture your logic. Uh, this time, CMMN is a declarative unstructured event condition action. So rather than prescribing what should happen next, you are within a context reacting to events. So when this event is happening, uh, if this condition is met, then I do this action. So it's a much more flexible uh, way of reacting into environment that are less predictable into the order of things. So let me try to put in context how uh, these two sets of standards complement one another as we're looking into the context of healthcare. So at this end here, we have the pure data. So this is data uh, coming from EHR or EMR, mostly EMR type of thing, device, wearable, diagnostic claims. And the first level is to try to integrate all these data points, these silo basically into some kind of aggregated data view. If you add the FHIR standard on top, the FHIR standard brings in common schema, identity resolution and medical resource concept. And these combined with your data provide you uh, what basically computable data. So you have the capability of doing data automation, which is quite nice and very valuable. And this is where a lot of the industry is at, is at this level of doing computable data. Moving forward, if we, if we add to this the notion of CDS hook and smart on fire, 
then we have data in a clinical context. So Hook and Smart puts that data in the context or extract that data within the context, the clinical context. So data in context is really information. So true CDS Hook and Smart, we get metadata, context, and event awareness. And that's very valuable because now, rather than just automating data, we're automating information, which is very valuable to our clinicians and people involved, our subject matter expert. Then when we add the BPM Plus uh, standards into the mix, uh, we gain tasks and activities, roles and responsibility, decisioning, case management, event orchestration. We can even throw in AI and machine learning and CQL, the clinical quality language. And when you add all this to the mix, then you can do an orchestration of this information. So this is applied information. So now we're really working at the knowledge level. So we have workflow and decision automation, which basically leads to what we consider intelligent healthcare automation. John, anything you want to add here at this point? Uh, yes, thanks, Denny. Um, I think when uh, people uh, look at uh, building systems uh, using modeling, the two approaches are one, or two goals really, uh, would one either be documentation or automation. If you're dealing with a documentation, it's uh, relatively straightforward and somewhat simple once you get familiar with the languages. Once you want to go to automation, it becomes uh, more uh, complicated because you have to orchestrate all these different tools uh, to get the data flow. Uh, when you have a system using multiple models, there's a lot of data. If you manually have to give it or you have to struggle to get it, uh, doctors and clinicians and nurses aren't happy. It's only when you have the free flow of information back and forth that you can get true automation, and that's where the power is. And although it's more work, that's where the future is going to be. Thanks, Denny. Thanks, John. So, so fundamentally, if what if I understand clearly what you're saying is that you can use these uh, different standards to visually capture and document what things should happen and how and when they should happen. Uh, but when we want to turn this into an actual automation, uh, then you have to uh, dive much deeper into the data and its structure and how this comes into play. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So at Trizotech, we promote a model-driven approach uh, to creating these kinds of uh, knowledge elements or knowledge artifacts uh, that are these models. Uh, and this model-driven approach basically goes into these four steps. Starting from some narrative, uh, we move into uh, what's a, what we call a computational independent model. The computational in independent model basically just specify the behavior, how things should happen, what should come first, and what I should react to. Uh, then we have the platform independent model. Uh, this is a logical model that is executable that can actually run, but is not tied to a specific platform or a specific deployment. And then we have the platform specific model, uh, which is the same logical uh, model, the same logical uh, execution, but this time within a very specific context. Uh, and we're gonna talk today about how uh, we can help close the gaps as you're transitioning from one version of these model to the other uh, to simplify your work and make it easy. Anything else you'd like to add, uh, John, at this point? Well, I think uh, for uh, people uh, at, uh, coming to the webinar, uh, understanding this uh, uh, image probably is going to be key uh, if you're interested in automation. Um, People get the narrative pretty straightforward. People get the uh, computational independent model okay. But to take it through the other levels where you're actually wiring and doing the hooking up uh, of the different uh, 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 systems that are needed to interact, that's where the difficulties can arise. Uh, well, I should say the challenges arise. And that's where if you can have things that make it simpler, your job is more reliable 
and uh, much simpler. Okay, thank you, John. So, moving from this kind of best practice or you know recommended approach, um, we'd like to make the comment that when you're looking at healthcare integration, it's it's wonderful to have all the interoperability at the data level, but we need more. We need more than just the data interoperability. We should be able to have, you know, integration based on API, which Fire provides us. Uh, we also want to be event driven to be able to react to the events happening, because as we know in healthcare, it's not just about uh, a particular piece of information traveling, it's about the actual context. What events, what is actually happening right now? Uh, and, 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 and ideally, uh, we have a semantic driven type of integration. By semantic driven, I mean uh, a clear understanding, a completely dis disintegrated environment where both the people enacting this care plan and the system, the machines helping you into this, this care plan have the same interpretation of what's going on. Uh, John, anything you want to add at this point here? Um, I think that uh, no one's uh, worked uh, as the uh, systems are being used. Uh, people are trying to understand how uh, clinicians and the software will interact uh, in an optimal fashion. Uh, getting complete automation can be difficult, but there's a lot of value in having uh, microservices uh, that are present that are listening for things that are happening that might indicate uh, a red flag is occurring or uh, something. Uh, there's been a change in the clinical status. That's where the event driven becomes incredibly important uh, so that the clinician can focus on their job and then someone out there is helping by keeping an eye out on all the peripheral information that's flooding by. Okay. Yeah, thank you, John. I totally agree with what you just what you just said here. Um, OK, so uh, this is my view of the world. I like to jump into a demo early and so people can get a grasp of what we're talking about. So uh, we'll jump into a quick demo of different aspects and then we'll come back to slide to prov provide more context and explanation as to what has been uh, demoed and presented. So let me just switch out of here. Um, so, so fundamentally here, we're within the Trizotec Digital Enterprise Suite, in particular the modeling suite. And part of the features that we offer to support in healthcare is this uh, place of healthcare uh, artifact, knowledge artifacts. In particular in here, we have a series of knowledge models about common conditions and common observation, and we'll go into more details of this after. But we also have here uh, a, a global set of clinical models. So some of these models uh, are more detailed than others. Uh, we have over a thousand different models available in over a hundred different categorization. Uh, so, you know, from running from asthma, different models to uh, colon cancer screening models. So a lot of topic there, and, and this comes with the Trizotec healthcare feature set. Now I mentioned uh, before uh, the, the, the clinical model. Uh, these are what uh, done, created, or uh, used using what we call the knowledge entity modeler. The knowledge entity modeler uh, is a tool that allows you to basically uh, specify your vocabulary that you want to use, uh, provide definition for this vocabulary, and this, these def definition can be supported with images. Uh, and then you can create what are called concept maps, which is to interrelate these uh, terms with one another, these concepts with one another. Now, when you create the concept maps, this provides further disambiguation. So now, not only do I have a definition and a visualization of anemia, I also have what are called fact types that tells me better disambiguation of what 
my term here or my concept is. Now, with the healthcare elements, you can also you can also provide alternative naming uh, to different elements, and you can also provide healthcare coding. So the healthcare coding uh, basically here allow you to add actual individual codes uh, to further disambiguate this term or concept, or you can uh, search uh, for uh, various uh, value set and then select the value set that really uh, captures the concept that you're trying to carry on here. So this is a very powerful element to make sure that we have uh, that semantical understanding to make sure that both all the different readers, both the human and the machine, so all the different readers of these models have a, uh, a similar understanding. John, you want to add something here or? Uh, not really. OK, perfect, perfect. So let me continue then. Um, another feature that we have are uh, what we call um, accelerators. So for example, here I have a fire accelerator and we'll go uh, more into the tool and all this, but I just want to show these basic elements that are part of this feature set. So I can go down the fire R4 structure, uh, clinical, diagnostic, uh, drag and observation here. And this gives me a uh, data object in the BPMN world. And this is data object here I can see that is of type fire observation. And when I explore the fire observation, I get the full structure of the fire uh, elements here. I can explode uh, the full structure down. So this is a very accelerator, fast accelerator to creating fire related model and then uh, creating your elements. So that's very interesting uh, for these different resource. But we also have the notion of connectors. And a connector is basically a way of uh, accessing the data. So here I'm looking at a piece of information. For example, if I drag this here, now I have a start event. So whenever this is a start event, that it will be triggered based on a particular uh, fire context. So my criteria can be a um, encounter. And when I do this, now every time a new encounter is created in my fire server, this process flow will be triggered. So this trigger will turn on. Now we, can, we, we also have different operation, fire operation. So I can, for example, you know, uh, get a condition. So if I put that here, now I can say basically, you know, whenever an encounter is created, uh, get a condition. Uh, and I could feed in a particular observation uh, in here uh, to uh, treat this in context. So you have a lot of different pieces that can accelerate your work uh, in creating workflows or decision related to fire. So let me jump into an example, a, a little bit more worked out example here, where we have here a small workflow on doing an initial assessment of anemia. Uh, basically, this is quite easy to read, and that's the value of these standards, is that basically when this starts, the clinical examination, we do a Worldale organization anemia grade. It requires these input and it provides this output, so it tells me the severity. The little box here tells me this is a decision. And then if there's no anemia present, we end with no anemia. But if there is a certain level of severity of anemia, then we go into a classification of the type of anemia based on MCV and RDW. And here you can see that my terms that were disambiguated previously in the knowledge entity modeler 
are available in my model. So it makes this model very clear as to what it is and what it's about. Now, for example, if I go and look at the decision model that is connected here, which is the World Health Organization uh, grading model, it's a simple model. Again, my terms are disintegrated. And if I go look at the decision, so this is saying this grading decision is based on age and years, sex, and hemoglobin. And here's the decision table that is according to the World Organization uh, guideline, uh, where you see each row is a rule. So the first row here says, well, if you're between, you know, 0.5 year and five year, we don't care about your sex. If your hemoglobin is higher or equal to 11, uh, your uh, anemia severity is none. Basically, there's no anemia severity. And then you can see each rule with the different range of age and situation that gives you the severity, all capturing the World Health uh, Guideline. Now, what's very interesting is that I can come here once I've populated this model and did all the data work that John mentioned before, I can actually go and publish this as a service. And with this one click publish, basically I get a service here. And this service uh, generates on the fly a form for me to consume this service. So you have here the form that was generated. It generates on the fly also a REST API fully documented that I can actually try out here. And it also uh, creates a test bench for me to do some testing and validation. Now, with the healthcare feature set, you also get here in this case, a CDS hook endpoint. Now I can copy this CDS hook endpoint and then I can move into our demo rig here. Uh, so this is a demo rig to showcase the features and basically imagine this as a mock-up of an EHR or EMR. I have all my different patients. I can go from patients, look at their conditions and I can add here my CDS hook service for the initial anemia assessment. And the hook is on the patient chain. So now you can see that all this logic here that was there, make that decision, then do the MCV, ran. And it told me that for Nancy Ross, uh, her severity is moderate and she may have one of these type of anemia. And if I go to another patient, I switch patient, this runs automatically and I received the CDS hook card. So this is the card that I received back. And you see this person has moderate uh, type of anemia. Now, inter interestingly enough, we can do, yes, a uh, CDS hook, but we can also do a smart on fire. So now rather than being hook on the patient, I can have a smart on fire app that starts. So if I run the initial anemia smart on fire, you see that I get the same result on my external application here that I did from the hook, which you would expect. And then there's another version here that I create, which is called the attended anemia. If I run this attended anemia model, then one particularity is that rather than doing a full automation, straight through automation, the system will ask me to confirm the inputs and the output. So this is what is in the fire server. And I may say, well, the hemoglobin is not really 8.3. That was maybe a couple of days ago. It's 9.4. Uh, and the anemia severity, yeah, okay, I agree with moderate, but I could change it. Uh, and then when it goes to create uh, the MCV RDW, I can accept the data and then you see the classification that is done. So it allows the clinician or the person there to uh, vet the data that is provided from uh, the different resource. So 
I'm going to stop here in terms of demo and we'll go back to our uh, slide deck to help us uh, see uh, these things in details. So everything that I just demoed is a subset of what we call the Trizotech Healthcare feature set. This feature set is a feature rich set of functions and capability that adds to the Trizotech uh, tool platform. Uh, the topics we'll cover in more details, knowledge features, terminology features, fire features, CDS hook, attended task, smart application, additional field function features, and learning feature. So let's, let's review what I've just basically shown in a very rapid way. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can give you a little bit uh, more context to all this. So the healthcare feature set provides a large set of reference model. Uh, I've already kind of showed you that list uh, where you have various clinical models, over a thousand there, and a set of different knowledge models uh, that are there. Uh, John, anything you want to add about these models? Uh, a little bit later on, uh, especially about the knowledge models, I'd like to make a few comments. OK, perfect, perfect. So. Let me continue then. And, and, and John, feel free to jump in any time and interrupt me uh, so that I don't have this conversation just by myself. <laughs> um, so uh, the clinical model, lots of reference model, over a thousand and over a thousand, a uh, hundred categories. Um, in the knowledge model, we've captured there the most common observation and the most common conditions. Um, this, as probably everybody would expect, uh, this is what we call a long tail. That is, there are, there are a series of common observation and a series of common condition that are quite present a lot. And then we have the long tail of the other condition and observation that are more rare and become very specialized. And um, when building uh, models, especially if you're building multiple models or if there's multiple authors engaged, the terminology becomes incredibly important. It's very easy to uh, have each person create their own uh, version of a data type, such as age or gender, uh, and that is uh, a problem later on because the system can only have one truth. So when you have different uh, terms used for the same concept, then uh, the system has to resolve it, and it may not always resolve it in the way you expect it to or want it to. So uh, developing a terminology becomes uh, extremely important for uh, uh, easy uh, development of complex systems. For a one-off system, for a demo uh, model, it isn't that important. But when you're getting serious, it's really, really, really important to have a control of your terms, your codes, so that everyone, everything is standardized. Uh, standards is the key. Uh, when we look at uh, the two files we see here, we have the common conditions and co uh, common observations. Uh, everyone should recognize that those are uh, fire terms uh, that are being used. And uh, we did a, a review of the models that we built, and it does turn out that uh, probably 100 laboratory tests and 100 diagnoses make up the vast majority of uh, calls that occur. So it is an overwhelming, if you build a very uh, a limited uh, set of data, it can help uh, in a broad range of model development. The uh, other thing that happens is that uh, many people have specialty areas such as electrocardiography, um, uh, gastroenterology, uh, where different terminology is used uh, in that uh, specialty that other people really don't use. What you will want to do then is have your common conditions as shown here, but then also add uh, dictionaries for the specialties. And then between them, you can eventually build out uh, a dictionary that uh, will save a lot of work later on. Back and and fundamentally, John, what you're saying is that this is iterative evolution. So we're creating more and more model uh, and more and more vocabularies that are specialized uh, rather than trying to uh, create everything up front. Right, because uh, uh, if you look at all the knowledge that's out there and all the terms, it seems overwhelming. 
Uh, and so that may be a barrier uh, people just feel I'll jump into and get started. But if you have, if you spend a little time up front, do a little prep work where you uh, have P someone in, uh, you, uh, in a team, you have one person in charge of semantics and terminology, that person can start small. And then as you say, you add knowledge as you need, but it always is uh, in development. There's somebody in charge to make sure that everyone is adhering to the standards that you've established. Yeah, because although we showed this uh, short anemia model there that was doing a workflow bringing in a couple of decisions to get to a, a particular outcome or decision. Um, in reality, if I'm tackling an actual care plan, uh, it may it may involve quite a lot of models, uh, hundreds of models probably. And uh, you, the number of data items that you need can also creep up uh, pretty quickly. And so uh, if you don't have control of your data, um, it's hard to have um, to build effective models and a not experience collision between models, uh, especially if you have, uh, if you're in an institution and you're importing models from other sources, that's even a greater risk for it. So uh, there really is a need, uh, the model should be standardized, the terminology should be standardized as much as possible. Hey, great. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, so we've also discussed the notion of concept maps. Concept maps are ways to interrelate concepts. So you don't only have a term and its definition, uh, but you can actually uh, interrelate these terms to classify this, them here. Here we see a particular uh, classification. Uh, the arrow with an open head means it a, is a relationship. So this says that a cardiac, a cardiac test is a cardiac uh, cardiovascular measure, uh, but you can build other relationships. So for example, uh, here the systolic blood pressure at ankle is used in an ankle to a brachial index. And then for each of these concepts or term, uh, you can add these uh, fact type. Those are done for you automatically from the diagram, and you can add some coding elements to them. Uh, and, and learning that uh, uh, how to build these concept maps and terms is not uh, very difficult, just takes a few hours, but it becomes very powerful, especially if uh, your team is using a subject matter as expert. Uh, one of the issues people always have is how do you effectively use that uh, person is usually a high cost individual uh, with limited time or maybe asynchronous with when your team meets. By having the uh, subject matter expert work on terminology, develop the relationships between things, they can work on their own pretty much, yet develop artifacts that are extremely useful when it comes time to building the models. Thanks, John. So uh, moving on from the, the, the knowledge model here, uh, there's the uh, terminology feature, uh, the healthcare terminology feature in particular, uh, the Tristech platform allows you to integrate a uh, fire terminology server that respect the HL7 standard for fire terminology server. And this integration, as I presented and demo, allow you to search and integrate uh, various terms and uh, different uh, coding um, and value sets to what you're working on now. So. Um, this is a very important aspect of disambiguating your terminology because it's great to take a particular term and exchange it in a casual conversation, but when we're in an actual clinical context or healthcare context, we want to make sure that we're saying exactly the same thing. And also that becomes very important for any of the, uh, you who have to look up codes, uh, both SNOMED and LOINC often have multiple way and multiple uh, codes that can be applied to the same concept. Uh, and so it's somewhat based upon the experience of the coder and the understanding of the situation, which one is the best. Uh, but if you have uh, multiple people uh, providing codes in a non-standard way, uh, it's not surprising that you can end up with multiple answers and that's bad. Uh, 
uh, by having this set up as truth and someone in charge of assigning the codes. That way you have harmonization throughout the entire system. You don't end up with the uh, problems. Now, uh, one solution to that might be the use of value sets, but that again, that also introduces issues uh, that need to be dealt with. Uh, but this becomes very important. Uh, the prep work in the uh, terminology, the relationships, and the coding uh, pays off much later on in more standard models that are easier to maintain. Yes, and and, and it is, and, and as John pointed out, it, it is very important to uh, do the upfront work. Uh, naturally, you cannot predict everything you will need, but to do the general scoping and get the terminology right and get what the agreement with the whole team on this terminology uh, is, is is quite important uh, here. So well, the natural tendencies of programmers is to jump right in and start coding. Uh, and while that's great in college and great on uh, demos, uh, if you're serious and you're dealing with something where there's ramifications as in healthcare, you want to be sure you're building the best models that you possibly can. OK. Um, let me, I'm having some technical difficulties here, sorry. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, the fire features in particular here that are part of that uh, set. Uh, so one of these feature is this drag and drop of fire resources. Um, this is a way to very quickly uh, get access to the definition. You don't have to worry about all these details. It's a simple drag and drop of whatever fire resource that you need to be involved into your model. Um, further along, these uh, fire resource also bring along the fire type, the fire data type, logical type structure uh, attached to elements. So it really is a, uh, a useful environment to uh, bring in fire into this, uh, into your models and what you're creating. Anything you want to add here, John? Uh, it's uh, not until you actually look at the data structures that are required. Do you realize the complexity of some of the things that are needed to acquire the data? And either if you build it, the uh, structures yourself uh, for the data types, or if you uh, uh, use the healthcare feature set, either way, it's, it's a lot of work uh, to complete these, but it's uh, if done properly, it's very useful work. Excellent. OK. Um, we also looked at connectors. Uh, these are basically, you know, uh, no configuration needed, drag and drop notions that you can just drop either a trigger or an operation on the canvas. Okay, let's jump a little bit more onto the CDS hook element and features of the TriSnet platform. So CDS hook <coughs> is a general hook pattern, and the hook pattern is basically the idea is that when I'm working from a particular location, in this case here, from within an EHR server, a Firebase type of EHR server here, I can trigger different action based on action that I do in my EHR. So in the demo there, I showed you how we could trigger on the switch of patient. So as I was changing from patient to patient in my EHR, it was triggering a service, in this particular case, the anemia service, and then this was returning back some information card or different type of cards, which are called CDS hook cards. Uh, there's different kind of cards, information card, suggestion card, smart app link card, and Trizotech support all of these in our implementation. So fundamentally, Trizotech offers, along with everything it does, offer a CDS hook server uh, to uh, serve your requirement. I didn't show these details before, but uh, we also have the CDS hook accelerator, which allows you to drag and drop uh, the CDS card 
uh, element onto the canvas, just like we did with the fire resource. Now, the benefit of doing that is that you get the actual uh, card uh, structure and information, and there's two there. One is a single card, the other one is a collection of cards. So the three bars here means the collection. So you can see here uh, that I can work with the various elements. Now, this allows me to create different type of cards according to the CDS hook standard. So in here, uh, you can see for this particular example here of dyspepsia, uh, I'm sending information, warning, and uh, um, severe uh, or high level information. And this is creating coloring into my EHR. So depending on the type of card you send, uh, you can have multiple cards coming out as shown here, and you can change uh, the uh, actual layout and content of these cards um, as you move forward. Anything you want to add here, John, about CDS? Uh, no. OK, thank you. Um, OK, let's carry on then. Um, smart application, so smart on fire uh, features. Uh, as we demoed, we, uh, we have the possibility of auto-generating smart on fire web, web apps uh, from the model. Um, and when you do so, uh, you will have the information. So you see here, uh, in this particular case, I have a CDS hook endpoint and a smart on fire endpoint. It gives me everything I need, my client ID, my launch URI, and all the details of a smart on fire app. And then when I add the Smart on Fire app within my EHR, it gives me a button to basically uh, press the button to initiate the Smart on Fire app. So uh, as opposed to CDS hook, which is a reaction to an action that I'm doing in my EHR, changing patient or looking at a particular condition or observation, here this is a voluntary uh, button press that I have to do in a smart context. So I have to actually say, okay, I want to start the smart app on that particular patient context. Okay, uh, moving on, attended task. I didn't show the model of this, but I did discuss or show uh, the end result, which is the notion that rather than having the model completely automated in a straight through fashion, we can also involve the uh, subject matter expert or clinician uh, at the input or output of any task. So basically here you can see this is a Trizotech feature. You don't have to change the model. You just have to add this attribute that this is an attended task and now you can make it attended at the input and or at the output. So that was the demo of the second Smart on Fire app that I showed you where I was going uh, from one to the other. Uh, John, do you want to comment a little bit about the importance of having the clinician uh, being involved at different moments? Well, this is one of my favorite uh, features uh, for building models. And uh, the reason is, is that the one thing that clinicians really hate and uh, the FDA really hates is the idea that you have an automated black box where it just kind of you put data in, you get an answer, but you don't know how the how you got that answer and you really can't influence it or uh, change it based upon the conditions you're in. Uh, this allows the person to uh, be at a, a key decision point and to decide is this valid input data and then look at the output and decide is this a valid output data, then we can make the change. Uh, these uh, interactions are all documented, so uh, I can, uh, as a responsible phys uh, clinician, I can put my mark on patient care. And that's really big for uh, uh, acceptance. It's really important for best care. And it's also important to keep uh, regulatory people happy because uh, the person who's supposed to make the decision is making the decision and you've got documentation of that effect. Very powerful. Excellent. OK, uh, moving on, um, additional field function feature. I didn't really demo this, uh, but basically feel is the expression language that is used to make all the logic 
uh, behind the diagrams and, 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 and specify what we want to happen. And with the healthcare feature set, Trizotech is adding some field function uh, that are helping you here. I'm showing the field function related to coding so that you can get you know, uh, the codes for a particular term according to your knowledge models or uh, vice versa, uh, get the term from a particular code that you're using. So it allows you to move easier through the coding that you define in your knowledge entity model. Another uh, great feature of the, the healthcare feature set is a, our learning package where uh, John goes through uh, the basic mechanics on how you start from a narrative, a CPG narrative, and take it all the way to a platform specific model. Um, and this is a very good introduction. It guides you to the best practice, a little bit of uh, details on how to do things. It's not necessarily a how to do thing uh, training or material, but it's more of a guidance. Um, and John, you've worked out a pretty big example in there. Uh, yes, uh, dealing with um, uh, pediatric ingestions uh, is the topic that we use to uh, show how it evolves, how a model might evolve through the system. Now, something that is relatively new uh, for uh, training is something that uh, Denny has been working on, which is on the uh, development of uh, recipes, uh, where there'll be a new tool that uh, when you're faced with an issue, like how do I generate a CDS card, uh, the step-by-step -step, uh, cookbook uh, instructions will be there uh, with uh, assistance as you go through to help the uh, new learner go through a lot of the new concepts that they'll have to acquire. Yeah, thank you, John. And yes, the cook, the cookbook is, is a new piece that is coming to uh, the healthcare features set. Um, so we, we can move to our conclusion, um, and, 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 and that goes to the first point, that the Trizotech healthcare feature set is a continuously evolving set of features. Um, within the next couple of weeks, uh, the cookbook will have a lot of healthcare recipe, basically showing you how you actually do things where the training material we were just discussing was more about the best practice and the steps to get to what uh, to success. Uh, the cookbook is more about how doing particular actions. Another future enhancement that we're working on that's going to be coming along soon, we hope, is uh, notions of the fire, what we call fire semantical lifting. So fire uh, gives us raw data and has a lot of metadata around the raw data. Uh, but you have to be able to take this data and this metadata together and extract it, pulling it and processing it so that you really have a uh, situational understanding. Now, this situational understanding is very important and it's going to be based mostly on different uh, constraint from various perspectives, so temporal. So, like for example, blood pressure is interesting, but the latest blood pressure. So in fire, I have the notion of blood pressure. Uh, the latest blood pressure is a semantical layer that I have to treat the fire extraction data that I do. Uh, so we're looking at the best way possible to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to basically get to the semantical level of that uh, of that fire information. And practically, it's, there's a lot of use in this uh, for uh, healthcare operations uh, because one of the whole uh, issues that comes up is, do I have uh, knowledge that I can access or do I need something new to fill the gap? Uh, if you have data that is existing that you can use, you don't want to have to repeat the test because that's costly. That adds uh, that's a, an additional cost. Uh, you always want to use data that uh, is available that fits your need. However, you don't want to accept data that's out of date or irrelevant. So uh, having an understanding of the data can help you decide how to reduce unnecessary testing uh, whenever possible. Excellent. So. Uh, we have still a bit of time, so I suggest we move to a, a few questions that we're getting. Um, so let's start with the question here. I'm going to try to 
interpret the question as good as possible. So the first question is, in the clinical module, is it each disease slash concept mapped to one module or a new definition derived? I'm not sure I understand completely what you mean by module here. And if, and if you want a preciser question, uh, feel free. Uh, but, but the granularity is left to the modeler. So uh, if that's what you're asking about, you can create the concept at the granularity level that you want, and then you disambiguate that concept so that you can reuse it into your models. John, anything you want to add to this? Does this ring a bell to you? Or? Uh, I didn't quite follow the. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. Again? I didn't quite follow. In, in the clinical module, is it each disease concept mapped to one module or a new definition derived? Okay, um, it depends on how you build. I mean, that's where you have a chef's choice in how you build things. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, it really depends on what your goals are and how you want to structure it, but there won't be one model for one disease. Uh, there can be, there may be multiple ones because every disease has multiple uh, perspectives. Uh, and it would be, indeed be very hard to uh, have just one model uh, uh, reflect all the nuances that might be there. Uh, that, that's a difficult one to answer. Okay. The next question is, are you specializing fire profiles are using the base or using the base fire profile? Um, in the accelerator right now, we're offering the base uh, profile, uh, but we can we can import uh, different uh, profiles as accelerator as well. So uh, right now, uh, out of the box, we only provide the base profile, but uh, it's easy to uh, add in profile as needed. And that's something that we're working at improving too, so that we make it easier for our customers to integrate their own profiles or existing profile as needed. Uh, another question, if common conditions or observation are named as knowledge models based on frequent usage of clinical modules, then is a subset we are keep building based on usage and name as knowledge models? Um, okay, uh, so I, I think the question is about how uh, we can augment, you know, the, the common condition and observation. Uh, and John, you already mentioned, you know, creating other knowledge models. So, so the notion of knowledge models is their models. You can have multiple knowledge, many models, and they can interact with one another. Uh, some can be specialized, some can be more generic. John, what's your view on all this? Um, uh, uh, that's a difficult one because you're not, uh, on the one hand, there are the concepts, but also then there's the pragmatic and practical aspects of maintaining your dictionary. The more terms you've got, the, the more uh, nuanced uh, uh, things can be, but also then the, the higher the overhead in maintaining it. Uh, and where the sweet, uh, there's pros and cons for both, uh, but uh, there has to be a point where it's optimized, uh, you know, it reaches a, a burden, uh, you know, some type of graph where there's a sweet spot uh, where you have the right number of terms to meeting your needs. In general, the fewer elements that you need, uh, the happier you will be. Uh, the more terms you bring in, the heavier your load will be. Uh, and so uh, if you're willing to expend the energy, go for it. Uh, but usually what you want is uh, the smallest number of terms to meet your goals. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, is it possible to develop synonym terminology features in the future? Uh, for example, this, uh, this dipsnia, versus short of breath? Uh, the answer is yes, it's possible right now. So I, I clicked the button, but I didn't really show it in details in the demo, uh, but you can have what we call alternative terms or uh, alternative terms for the concept, which are basically the notion of synonyms here. 
So and you, yes, can have this, as, and you can have as many as you want. Exactly, exactly. And you can you can also make alternative terms, acronyms, or um, so yes, so this feature is already in there and is, is quite heavily used in fact. Okay, and we have one last question. How can you audit what the system did on a given patient? Uh, so, so fundamentally, uh, that's more on the automation side. So there's the two side. There's the modeling of your uh, care pathway or clinical workflow and decision, and there's the execution. So once you, you take your model, you deploy it as a service, and then the service gets executed. And on the service side, you can turn on uh, a trace, and you can de de decide the level of verbosity of that trace. So you can have the trace is only capturing what is provided to the service and what is outputted from the service. You can turn up the trace one level higher, which is uh, into getting all the internal steps that are happening throughout the service. And then you have the full uh, verbose debug mode, which will give you basically everything that's going on, all the data, all the, you have all the data. And then these logs, you can direct to where you want and do uh, further treatment. So this could be for uh, machine learning treatment or business intelligent type of treatment of this information. As John mentioned, um, it is a very important feature to be able to audit what's actually happening. So that's why we have the notion of yes, automation when we can, we have human in the loop uh, through the attended task, and we have all this uh, auditing capability. And that's very important in case there's uh, a problem that's encountered. Um, a lot of times people have a program and they don't really know what happened when, because you can audit the entire process. I mean, every step, there's a record of what happened at that point. You can pretty much go through the entire execution and decide where did, uh, was there a problem and where where it occurred? And that's really important uh, in situations where uh, you're not getting what you expected or if there's litigation that might be involved. And we have one more question and that's going to be our, our last question. Uh, the question, is it best to start with a simple test model with a handful of data elements to ring out the endpoints for automation? There are so many internal system in an, inst in an institution. Uh, yes, you got that very right there. Uh, the whole idea is start small, make many step, iterate, and then go to where you want to go. So at first, you should basically just look at, you know, getting data from your different systems, making sure you can bring in the data, that you can map it to the structure you need to map it. And that's what the notion of the cookbook and the recipe that John mentioned is these micro step of uh, integration. And, and that's where a lot of the challenge are is in this integration. But the TriStick platform uh, is very powerful to help you with the integration. And once you've uh, basically tried these recipes of integration, uh, then you can pile on your, your clinical knowledge. Uh, it's probably a good idea. Sometime in organization, it's going to be two separate groups doing this work. So it's going to be more of an IT kind of group that's going to be doing the integration testing and more of a clinical group that will do uh, the clinical aspect of the model. So uh, it depends on each organization. But also you don't want to spend a lot of time building a really, really, really complex model, which is what people often are tempted to do. And after you spend a whole lot of time developing this uh, very nice model, you suddenly find out it doesn't work. It's a horrible feeling. Far better to do proper engineering and to lay out your things, sketch it out, then flush it out uh, as uh, you have time to get the endpoint you want. Thank you, John. I totally agree. So this is all the time we had today. Thank you very much for attending and participating. We hope this was useful and insightful to you. Uh, we'll uh, see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.